next talk is by Shinshin Ge. Uh, she is currently a postdoc in Massimo Scanziani's lab at UCSF. Um, though she would be presenting her work from her grad school work uh, from Michael Kreh's lab at Yale. And she's going to be talking about retinal waves um, and how they prime visual motion detection by simulating future optical flow. The stage is yours, Shinshin. Thank you. Okay, can you see my slides? Okay, thanks for the introduction. Um, hello everyone, my name is Xin Xin. Um, as Lena uh, mentioned, I'll be presenting my PhD work from the Korea Lab at Yale. And before I start, I would like to um, acknowledge the great team that um, enables this work, um, especially Kathy, who's heavily involved in a lot of experiments I'll be talking about. Um, I would also like to um, thank my PhD advisor, Mike, for his um, great mentorship and um, support. So, um, sorry, okay. So the main question that um, we are interested in is during development, how does the visual system prepare itself for um, the future incoming stimuli without knowing what it is going to see? And to investigate this question, we use the mouse visual system as our model. So here's just a brief background. Um, neonatal mice don't open their eyes until P13. And actually before P9 or P10, their visual system does not receive any visual inputs. Yet from um, previous studies, we know that there is a lot of spontaneous retinal activity, which is wave-like that um, exists during this um, window without the input of sensory inputs. And um, here I'm just showing you examples of the readout of the retinal activity um, by imaging the spontaneous activity in the retinal ganglion cell axons in the supraclaculus. And so for today, um, what I'm going to focus on is to try to understand the main um, function or the spatial, the function of the spatial temporal features of the retinal waves in visual system development. Um, so what we found is that actually the retinal waves are not random. In fact, during a transient window, the majority of the waves propagate from the temporal to nasal direction in the retina, corresponding to forward to backward in visual space. Um, the wave direction um, flow pattern actually is also not homogeneous on the supraclicalis, but rather exhibiting this um, specific pattern. Interestingly, what we found is that the wave optic flow pattern matches very well with the optic flow path, sorry, the wave flow pattern matches very well with optic flow pattern from the animal self forward motion after eye opening, which is probably the most um, likely um, optic flow inputs after animal um, visual system matures. And in contrast, um, the wave flow does not correspond very well to optic flow from um, rotatory motion. Um, so we were very interested in um, the origin as well as the function of the directional bias retinal waves that mimics the future optic flow. So using pharmacological approach, we found that GABA-A is required for wave directionality. So here I'm showing you um, example movies before and after the GABA Z injection, which is a GABA-A blocker. And you can see that the wave directionality is disrupted um, with the GABA Z. In addition, we also found that the starboard subacrine cells, which provide asymmetric GABAergic inhibition, which further confer direction selectivity in the adult retinal circuits, are also important for wave directionality. So in a transgenic animal where the asymmetric inhibition from starboard subacrine cells along the temporal nasal axis is disrupted, we found the disrupted wave um, directionality. So these results suggest that um, the directional retinal waves are mediated by asymmetric GABAergic inhibition from the starboard semicrine cells. And so last, I would like to um, talk about our efforts to understand the function of the directionality of the waves. And to answer this question, we inject gabazine chronically from P7 to P12 to disrupt the wave directionality during this time window. 
We then measured the visual response properties of individual cells in the superior colliculus right after eye opening. And here you can see that individual cells respond pretty well to the drifting grading stimulus in both the saline injected control or the gabazine injected group. However, um, we found that there was a significant reduction of the selectivity or the tuning strength of the cells preferring temporal direction in the gabazine injected group compared to the saline. And this is not the case for other directions. And here is just a summary showing you that um, for all the cells that prefer different directions, only the temporal direction preferring cells were significantly disrupted in the GABA's injected group. Um, so overall, um, I've showed you that during development, we found a transient window where the wave directionality exhibits this temporal to nasal bias. And this is mediated by asymmetric inhibition from the starboard semicrine cells. Interestingly, we found that directional bias waves resemble this future optic flow from animals' forward self motion. And the wave directionality um, also sets up um, or helps the development of motion detection in the downstream visual areas, such as the supercolliculus. And with all these results, we think um, our results suggest a very um, smart and efficient way of the sensory system development, which is that the developing sensory system primes itself for the most likely visual inputs by generating spontaneous activities that mimic important features of future sensory inputs. And with that, I would like to um, thank everyone for your attention and also be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Chin Chin. Uh, that was really great. Um, let's see if we have any questions. While we wait for questions from the audience, I actually have a question uh, regarding how it, basically the you know you have the direction selective uh, retinal ganglion cells as well that provide input to uh, both the DLGN and the superior colliculus. So how mm -hmm. um, is their activity, like their wave featured activities different compared to the non-direction selective retinal ganglion cells? Um, and also whether um, the changes in the wave direction due to one cell type versus the other has any influence on this motion detection later on in life? Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, I don't have the direct um, results here, but I can tell you that we also imaged um, other um, retinal ganglion cells that, um, so like specific types of retinal ganglion cells that does not prefer um, this temporal to nasal direction. And it turns out that those um, retinal ganglion cells also um, sh exhibit this temporal to nasal um, wave directionality. And also in our experiments, when we express the GCAM, we um, label all the retinal ganglion cells, including the non-direction selective ones. So we think that um, the majority of the um, retinal ganglion cells are participating in the spontaneous retinal waves in the same fashion. Very nice. Uh, we have a question from Daniel Gardner. Mm -hmm. And he asks, do you have any sense that waves at other developmental times are priming for other stimulus classes? Yeah, um, this is very interesting. Um, so um, the previous studies, um, for example, has already showed that the um, the amount of retinal waves or um, the frequency of the retinal waves, specifically during this P0 to P9 window where the waves are uh, mediated by um, acetylcholine transmission are important for, um, for example, the refinement of retinotopy in the superior colliculus or um, um, the thalamus, um, as well as the eye specific segregation. So the input from both eyes to the superior colliculus um, or the um, thalamus. And um, beyond that, um, I think there hasn't been specific experiments testing like certain features of the um, retinal waves in terms of the, um, their response, um, in, in terms of their function in, um, for the development. But um, because the waves show this very complex patterns and changes a lot during development, we suspect that it may also be important for such as setting up the receptive fields in downstream areas or um, 
like the orientation for activity or other properties. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I, I know at least in the primary visual cortex, both mm -hmm. orientation selectivity and direction selectivity is developmental. So early on, you uh, don't have much direction selectivity and then it just uh, gets strengthened as the animal matures. And so um, how does that work in the superior colliculus? Right, so um, in the superior colliculus, we found that um, there was already a lot of direction selective cells right after eye opening. Um, there may be some um, further um, refinement of the tuning strengths um, and maybe a little bit of the um, preferred direction or orientation, but we already observed a large proportion of cells that um, respond to um, the direction, um, direction select, um, directional motion or orientations. Um, and I guess um, in comparison to the visual cortex, we also found a lot of um, visual cortex, um, um, we also found a lot of cells in the visual cortex that are direction selective um, or orientation selective right after eye opening. But there was, as you mentioned, a, also a um, developmental refinement after eye opening. Right, right. Um, I'm a bit curious about your gabazine experiments. Mm -hmm. uh, so those were injected in the superior colliculus, right? Not in the retina? Um, those are injected in the retina. Oh, okay, in the retina. I see. Yeah, yeah. So it is disrupting the waves in the retina itself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you have any... Um, I guess clues ab about if you disrupt the local activity within the superior colliculus, how would that, during this developmental time window, how does that affect um, the, the optic flow essentially, or the direction flow? Is it is it purely inherited from the retina or are there some local circuits that emerge uh, as a result of this? Right, that's a very good point. Um, so um, previous studies um, from the Curl lab have shown that um, probably up till um, eye opening, the supracolliculus activity is completely inherited or like ma majority of the activity is inherited from retina ganglion cells. Um, so um, we haven't done anything to specifically disrupt the um, activity in the supracolliculus, but actually I can imagine that if we mismatch the posterior, um, the, the postsynaptic activity versus the presynaptic activity in the supracolliculus, we may create some um, like different disruption to, for instance, for setting up the uh, receptive fields or retinotopic refinement. Um, Cool. Uh, we actually have one more minute left, so I'm going to mm -hmm. ask, take the liberty to ask one more question. Yeah, yeah, and sure. That's about uh, looming stimuli. So you know how the, uh, there's been a lot of focus on, you know, predatory type of looming stimulation that are encoded in the su superior colliculus, and I feel like this um, th these uh, waves, retinal waves, could also be a contributing factor in the emergence of such looming uh, stimuli vo vogue behaviors. So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think um, this is certainly a possibility. We haven't specifically examined um, the responses to the looming stimulus in the superior colliculus, um, but I would imagine that um, potentially with this global pattern of retinal waves, it may um, to some extent help um, the responses, but we don't know. I, I think this is purely just my guess right now. All right. Well, that was very fascinating. Thank you. Thank Shinshin. you. Um, next we have